Good evening. Will the members and our guests please take their seats? This meeting will now come to order. As all members have received a copy of the call of tonight's meeting, the reading of the call will be omitted. At this point, I'll ask Bruce Winningham. Uh, I believe you will be joined by Kip Bergweger and Bob McKnight, is that correct? Yes, sir. To lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag, flag of the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now I'll call upon Mr. Winningham and uh, Mr. McKnight and Bergwager to tell us uh, what they have planned on, this is the Greenwich Covenant of Care, is that correct? Yes, sir. For, uh, for Veterans Day. Good evening, we're here to talk very briefly and quickly about uh, this year's Veterans Day walk. I'm joined with Bob McKnight and Kip Bergweger to introduce the notion that this year the focus is gonna be those who served our country in uniform in Vietnam. Both of these gentlemen served our country in uniform in Vietnam. Thank you and welcome. When I was young, Everybody understood the meaning of 11, 11, 11. Armistice Day then was on a par with the 4th of July. Even after it morphed into Veterans Day, it was still held in high esteem. Schools closed, banks closed, governments gave a holiday out of respect. Now we see a renaissance in acknowledging the significance of this day. I invite all of you to join with my fellow Vietnam veterans and others who wore and wear the uniform to stroll down the avenue on Veterans Day in a show of support for those presently serving and those who have served and sacrificed in the past to safeguard our freedoms. Thank you. Thank you. First, I want to thank Bruce Winningham for all his efforts in organizing and supporting the Community Walk to Honor Veterans, which will take place as stated on Veterans Day. I urge all of you who do not have other commitments to join the march and be sure to carry a flag. The march will have a special focus on veterans of the Vietnam War. Having townspeople participate in the march or line the street will have special meaning for many of these veterans. As you know, 2015 is the 50th anniversary of the start of the buildup of U.S. forces in Vietnam. 50 years sounds like a long time. I suspect that some of our members had not even been born when the escalation <coughs> began, although I also suspect that other members remember those days very clearly. In the years preceding 1965, the country's focus was primarily on the civil rights movement. However, protests against the war had already begun, even though most people had not reached the point of opposition. However, in February 1965, U.S. planes began regular bombings of, Nor of Vietnam, North Vietnam. During that year and following years, the number of U.S. troops grew to 500,000 men and women. Eventually, the anti-war movement gathered strength and led to memorable pro protests. For some people, the anti-war sentiment persisted and did not distinguish between government officials who made the decisions and the veterans who answered their country's call. Over a time, I believe that that sentiment has changed and that many people have come to appreciate the commitments and sacrifices our veterans have made. If you feel that way, we ask that you attend the parade and simply show the men and women who deployed that you recognize what they experienced and appreciate their responses when they're asked by their country to go to war. Thank you and I hope to see you there. We have found 50 residents of Greenwich who deployed to the war in Vietnam. Uh, almost all of them will be there. And the theme of it is welcome home because it's something that they all agree they rarely heard in the past 50 years, as well as the words, we respect what you experienced. 
So you all have um, an email uh, that hopefully you've received or it will be referred to you by a member of your district. We ask that you forward it to spread the word so that as many of the town as possible can come out to this event. November 11, 9.30 in the morning. If you were here in the prior years, this is earlier, please, 9.30 a.m. on the 11th. Um, <clears throat> this year is essential. Uh, in the 10 years of the war we're now in, we've sent 2.7 million young men and women over 10 years, and God rest their souls, 5,000 have died. Vietnam was also 10 years. Vietnam was also 2.7 million uh, deployed, but 58,000 died. Two-thirds of them were under 21. Seventy percent of all baby boomers from that age group are still alive today. But 70 percent of those who came back from Vietnam have passed away. So it was a complicated experience for those who were there, and it was even more difficult in many ways when they came home. One final thing, last year we did World War II. Most people uh, imagine you know, movie star visions of those who serve in the military when in reality, all military men and women who serve refer to themselves as having a minuscule, tiny piece of a squad, of a platoon, of a company, of a regiment, of a brigade, of a division, of an army, and that they dismiss any notion that they had a significant role. But in World War II, guys, I found one who doesn't fit that mold. And he's Tom Burns' father. And he's, he actually took actions that shortened the war, even though no one made a movie about him or wrote a book about him or put him on the front of Life magazine, but he, will, he used qualities you're going to recognize, intelligence, patience, a clear vision of what is right, selfless unseen work, courage under pressure in the father and in the son. So for one moment, could we please fill the room with respect and admiration for Tom's father? Thank you. Well, Bruce, you're very kind, and I definitely have to say the, uh, the respect you accorded my father last year, along with other members of this body, Lloyd Hall, uh, the Fasliotis, um, Mr. Fasliotis was there as well. Uh, it has meant everything to him, and uh, we thank you very much. Our family is most grateful for your kindness. All right. Uh, as all members have received a copy of the minutes of our September 21st meeting, the reading of those minutes will be omitted. Are there any suggested changes to those minutes? Hearing none and absent objection, the minutes as submitted stand adopted upon unanimous consent. Bob May, Chair of District 12. Mr. Moderator, town officials, members and guests. On Monday, October 19th, the members of District 12 were deeply saddened to learn of the passing of longtime fellow member and friend, Robert Cavie. Born in New York City, Bob earned a bachelor's degree in mathematics from the University of Rochester and a master's degree in electrical engineering from Columbia. He completed postgraduate work in system science as a National Science Foundation Senior Research Fellow at Polytechnic Institute of New York. Bob was an innovator in the field, in, in the field of information technology and operations research. During his career, he worked as a defense space electronics systems engineer at ITT Laboratories and Sperry Rand. He served as manager of operations research at ITT World Headquarters in New York City and also as vice president of fixed income portfolio optimization at Merrill Lynch Capital Markets. Bob's passion for challenging and mentoring analytical minds was evident in his guest lectures at the Rodney White Center for Financial Research at the Wharton School of Business and at the University of Chicago. His professional organization memberships included the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, and the American Finance Association. 
Bob moved to Greenwich in 1971, and in 1980 began his long service with the RTM in District 12. He served as the district's delegate to the Public Works Committee and went on to become its vice chair and later chairman. During his tenure on Public Works, he supported a reasonable, planned, and budgeted approach to the maintenance of our community infrastructure. Bob was fastidious in his participation in the RTM oversight of all revenue and expenditure plans. Employing his financial skills, he was deeply involved with and concerned about the handling of the town pension fund. A further example of his dedication to the RTM was his attendance record. I believe that in his 36 years on this body, you could probably count his absences on the fingers of one hand. Bob also served on several building committees, including the Glenville School and most recently the MESA project at Greenwich High School. In his leisure time, Bob enjoyed sailing, listening to and performing opera, and traveled to China, Turkey, and the Caribbean. Perhaps his greatest pleasure was spending time on the sidelines of his grandchildren's soccer games. District 12 asks that the members of this body join with them in recognizing his service to the town and the many contributions made by Robert Cavie for the betterment of the Greenwich community. In his honor, we ask that these comments be included in the minutes of the meeting. Thank you. Will the members please rise for a moment of silence in memory of Bob Cavie. Thank you. Two announcements. Um, everyone knows about this candidate registration form uh, so that there's no confusion. The, the very first page and the last page have, have to be completed and uh, they're being collected up front. And our December meeting, which is the final meeting of our term, um, will be held at the new auditorium at Greenwich High School. So, so I encourage everyone, including those who may not be returning, and uh, we'd like to uh, say goodbye to you at that meeting. So I hope everyone will, will join us for uh, the December 14 meeting at the high school. All right, that brings us to the call of tonight's meeting. Since there are only three items, we will consider each separately in numerical order. Number, uh, item number one is a resolution postponed from our September meeting, so that is now before us. I will read it. Resolved that the following named person nominated by the Board of Selectmen be appointed as an alternate member of the Inland Wetlands and Water Courses Agency for a term expiring March 31, 2016. Stephen A. Fong. Candace Garthwaite with the report of our Appointments Committee. Good evening. Stephen Fong interviewed with the Appointments Committee on October 6th. The vote was 10-0-0. Districts 10 and 11 were absent. Stephen graduated in 2014 with an environmental studies major and a minor in coastal management. His employment history is primarily as a naturalist teacher in the areas of conservation and the environment. Uh, he is also an Eagle Scout, and scouting is how he connected with Peter Tessie. Stephen has attended at least one Inland Wetlands Agency meeting, and he has met with Michael Chambers, the head of the department, and additionally, he has met uh, with Brian Harris, a member of the agency, and he considers both to be potential mentors. Uh, he did change his party affiliation to unaffiliated from Republican in order to be eligible for appointment as an alternate. Thank you. Peter Berg, Chair of our Land Use Committee. Uh, good evening. Um, the Land Use Committee also interviewed Stephen Fong. I uh, have nothing to add to Ms. Gartwaite's uh, report except that Stephen Fong uh, is a lifelong resident of Greenwich. Our vote on the item was 10 0 0. Districts 3 and 7 were absent. Thank you. Discussion on item 1. Betsy Fruman, 
Chair of District 9. Inland wetlands and water courses, one word, is an important agency. Uh, it is a seven member agency and its decisions can truly affect people's lives. For that reason, I would rather see on this agency someone with more life experience, uh, more work experience under their belt than someone who graduated from college one year ago. So um, I will be voting against this. I do not know the young man, and I feel that you begin your career in uh, town life, uh, not on an agency, but possibly in the RTM. Uh, he is a member of District 9. We have had openings on District 9, and he has not chosen to seek these openings. He has, in fact, done, from what I can see, interesting internships, but has not put himself in a position to understand how the town functions. Further discussion on item one? Peter Berg. District Dayton. So, um, so as you did hear in the report, he, he did grow up in town. His uh, family owns a business in town, um, Thomas's Cleaners downtown. Um, he has a, uh, a, n a number of other of, of uh, cousins who live in town who I also know. I know uh, mem uh, many members of the extended family. Uh, he was a scout in town. He understands that the uh, clients of the wetlands agency are actually the wetlands, the critters who live in the wetlands, and he's very dedicated to their protection. Further discussion on item one. Will the district chairs please mark your voting cards, item number one, and proceed to pull your delegation. <laughs> item number two now comes before us. Peter Tessie, our first selectman. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Moderator, ladies and gentlemen of the RTM. Resolved that the following named person nominated by the Board of Selectmen be appointed a regular member of the Alarms Appeals Board for a term expiring 3-31-18. Dennis P. Yeski. Thank you. Will a member please move the adoption of the resolution? Resolution on item two has been moved and seconded. May we have the reports of the committees that considered this, beginning with our appointments committee, Candace Garthwaite. Um, Mr. Yeski goes by Peter, and he um, met with the Appointments Committee on October 6th. The vote was 10-0-0. Districts 10 and 11 were absent. Uh, Peter is an excellent nominee for this board. He is a member of the Costco Volunteer Company and president of the board of Costco Fire Patrol, Inc. He is well aware of the large number of false alarms due to the increase in automatic alarms townwide. And he is also well aware of who the repeat offenders are. And he is looking forward to adding his specific skill set and knowledge to the Alarm Appeals Board. Uh, Peter is a Greenwich native and is a real estate manager with First Hartford Realty Corporation. Thank you. John Harkins, Chair of our Town Services Committee. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, members of the RTM. Um, your Town Services Committee met and discussed this item and voted 9-0-0. Districts 3, 4, and 7 were absent. Candace Garthwaite covered all the important points. Thank you. Thank you. Discussion on item 2. Will the district chairs please mark your voting cards, item number 2, and proceed to pull your delegation. Item number 3 now comes before us. Peter Scher of the uh, Board of Education. Good evening. Recently, the Board of Education negotiated a collective bargaining agreement with the Greenwich Organization of School Administration, Administrators, also known as GOSA, for a three-year period. 
The agreement supports our objectives of controlling wage and benefit costs, assuring competitive compensation to attract and retain the best available principals, curriculum leaders, and other administrators of the school system, as well as better aligning the Board of Education with the overall labor strategies and practices of the town of Greenwich. Mr. Scheer, let's get, let's just I'm gonna get the offer item. the item, I'm get, I'm and then we'll get, get the, the, we'll get the reports of our committees, and then I'll call upon you for discussion. We just, we just want to get it before us, so the if you could item, just. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, the item is modified on the instruction of the town attorney. It shall now read, resolved, the representative town meeting of the town of Greenwich hereby approves the agreement between the Board of Education and the Greenwich Organization of School Administrators representing administrators for the period of July 1, 2016 to June 30th, 2019. This is the part that's been added. A failure to approve said agreement will constitute a rejection of the agreement as provided in Connecticut General Statutes 10-153D. All right, so that's a substitute resolution on item three. Will a member please move the substitute resolution? Substitute resolution on item three has been moved and seconded. David Detchen, chair of our Labor Contracts Committee. Mr. Moderator, members of the, fellow members of the RTM. Uh, your Labor Contracts Committee uh, met on 10 October to address whether to recommend approval by the RTM of this uh, recently negotiated collective bargaining agreement between the town's Board of Education and the Greenwich Organization of School Administrators, or GOSA. The GOSA represents about 55 elementary and middle school principals, various assistant principals, and other administrators in the Greenwich public school system. The committee voted 3-1-0 to recommend approval by the RTM. The contract covers three years, from 1 July 2016 to 30 June 2019. Note that this contract term extends beyond the introduction of the so-called Cadillac excise tax under the Affordable Care Act, sometimes called Obamacare. That tax is to be imposed upon supposedly expensive, excessively expensive health insurance plans and goes into effect in 2018. <clears throat> this is the first labor contract uh, the town has negotiated which goes into 2018 and that's why this Cadillac tax issue has come up at this point. I'll come back to the Cadillac tax in a moment. In most respects, the negotiation of this contract by the Board of Education uh, followed fairly conventional patterns. The explanos on this item are recommended reading since uh, they are fairly complete in describing the various issues that came up and were resolved during the course of the negotiations. The GWI agreed upon was 2.6% per year, the gross wage increase. This is almost exactly the average of gross wage settlements achieved by other Connecticut towns in negotiating GWI with their respective school administrators. However, you will note that the cost of contract table in the explanos indicates a GWI of 3.23% in 2016-2017. That's the first year of the contract. Why is that? For one, the BOE decided to grant a $1,000 addition to the compensation of elementary school principals because the BOE believed that the salary level of such principals was too low in relation to the salaries of other similar principals in other towns and might lead to a defection of Greenwich elementary school principals to other towns. In addition, the BOE negotiated to increase the number of work days for assistant principals from 220 days to 225 days during the course of the year so that the assistant principals will have the same number of work days as principals. Paying for those extra five days will cost the BOE an additional $35,000 in the next fiscal year, and that results in the 3.23% GWI in 2016-2017. <clears throat> Nevertheless, even with this 2.6% GWI, and even with the flat annuity payments to be paid by the BOE to each employee's account, 
uh, in that employee's, uh, the fact is that only one employee out of the 55 will be at the top of his particular category of employment. In the case of almost all other categories of administrators, including elementary school principals, middle school principals, and high school principal, the equivalent administrators in Darien, New Canaan, and Westport are still better paid than here in Greenwich. As I said, uh, all of this up to now was fairly uh, conventional. Uh, some may complain about the overall cost of contract or that certain issues were not raised. But let me remind you what is the LCC's standard of review. Obviously, the LCC is concerned about the overall impact of all labor contracts on the town's budget. And the LCC members, like most members of the L RTM, would love to have a GWI at the inflation rate and health care copay by the employees comparable to private industry. But our standard of review is not budget impact directly but rather whether the contract negotiated in light of the given circumstances and in light of the state labor legislation slanted against employers is a reasonable result. Implicit in the vote of the Labor Contracts Committee to recommend approval of this contract is the conclusion of the LCC that the negotiating results are reasonable. We in the RTM in voting on these contracts need to keep in mind that the union negotiators generally are not all that concerned about the impact of any negotiated contract on the town's budget. They are interested in getting the maximum benefits for their union members and they are not going to make concessions to the town unless they get something in return for their members. Those who would like for us to gain more concessions, whether it's the BOE or the town, from a union in a particular negotiation need to be ready to suggest proposals or concessions that the town is willing to make in order to gain the concessions we would like to have from the union. However, there is one aspect of this contract which has implications well beyond whether to approve this collective bargaining agreement for these 55 employees. When it came to health care in the negotiations, GOSA put on the table that it wanted to become a part of a state-run insurance pool the so-called Connecticut Partnership Plan, or CPP. The union noted that the health care premiums under the CPP would in all likelihood be much lower than those in the health care plan that Greenwich itself maintains. GOSA went so far as to say that it was willing to go to arbitration over this issue. <clears throat> let me give you some background on this and let me give you some explanation of our thinking within the Labor Contracts Committee because I think this is actually uh, the key uh, aspect of this particular negotiation and the key issue for the, for the RTM. State labor leaders and various state political leaders in Hartford began some time ago to realize that one unintended consequence of the Cadillac tax under the Affordable Care Act was that it was prodding various employers, including municipal employers, to consider def dropping defined benefit health insurance plans and moving toward defined contribution plans. <clears throat> that is, instead of the employer offering certain health benefits and then determining what the cost of those health benefits would be, the employer instead would make available to each employee a specified amount and then tell the employee to buy whatever insurance the employee wanted on a private health exchange. This is somewhat like what we've done with the defined contribution pension plan here in the town. <clears throat> in fact, since the current health care plans of Greenwich would generate a Cadillac tax in 2018 of as much as $6 billion, with a tax rising even more in subsequent years, Greenwich itself has been considering proposing a defined contribution health care plan to its unions. <clears throat> Seeing this, the state legislature in June enacted legislation that facilitates the ability of Connecticut towns to place their municipal employees into the already existing insurance pool for all Connecticut state employees. The idea is that this large pool of state and municipal employees will be able to achieve very substantial savings in health care costs even with a defined benefit plan. 
Supporters of this legislation are quite open in noting that one motivation for this legislation was to undercut the inclination of municipalities in Connecticut to propose defined contribution health care plans. In any event, <clears throat> many on the Board of Education, within town government, and even on your labor contracts committee, view this trend toward membership in the state insurance pool with some concern. Let me list some of those concerns that we certainly had in our discussion within the Labor Contracts Committee. First, the town has no control over plan design of the state program. The plan will be determined, plan design will be determined by government officials in Hartford. For example, <clears throat> after years of effort by the town to eliminate POS plans and to include all employees in high deductible plans, Town employees going into the CPP will, again, be in a POS plan. The fact is, plan design has a significant impact on premium costs. Of course, at some point in the future, the administrators of the CPP may move to a high deductible plan to keep costs under control. But currently, they are getting relatively lower costs in the POS plan due to the large, employee, large pool of insureds covered by the plan. Second, the second concern is that not only the issue of whether a town's employee goes into the CPP, but also whether the town's employees later leave the CPP is a mandatory subject of negotiation and arbitration. <clears throat> the June legislation specifically so provides. Thus, any desire of the BOE or the town later to withdraw from the state insurance pool may be blocked by an arbitration panel. Third, the third concern is that simply a concern about whether a state-run plan will be run efficiently and with proper concern for controlling costs. After all, <clears throat> it is not often that the phrase state-run program and words like efficient, competent, well-effective, and well-run are found in the same sentence, unless maybe there's a knot in there somewhere. Fourth, there is the concern that a plan run by Hartford will eventually be subject to poli uh, politicizing influence of the political process in the Connecticut State Legislature, <clears throat> so that the focus on the primary issue of providing cost-efficient health care will be lost. In the end, the BOE agreed uh, to GOSA's request to apply uh, for GOSA's employees' entry into the CPP, even though this agreement by the BOE may, in fact, undercut the ability of the town to resist the entry of other town unions into the CPP in any subsequent negotiations <clears throat> and any subsequent arbitration. Why did the BOE agree to GOSA's request? They did so, we believe, because the probable health care cost savings are simply too great to ignore. If one looks at the cost of contract table uh, of the BOE and the explanos, you can see that they estimate such significant health cost savings from, G from GOSA migrating from the town plans to the CPP that the total inc increase in cost of contract over the three-year period will be only slightly over 2%. This is despite the 2.6 GWI. Thus, the cost savings to the town of, <clears throat> of GOSA being in the CPP as opposed to the town plan would be greater than $1.5 million over the three years of the contract. Moreover, if other collective bargaining units of the town were to enter into the CPP, the total savings to the town over the cost of current health care plans of the town over the next several years could be many, many millions of dollars. And that amount doesn't include the up to $6 million in Cadillac tax, which would otherwise be due in 2018 in regard to the town's plans, but which may be avoided because of the lower premiums. <clears throat> um, there would be an increased cost in OPEP, uh, co there would be an increased OPEP costs because of certain structures of the plan, but those increased costs are overwhelmed by the amount of premium savings that would be achieved. But how did the BOE address the concerns of the Labor Contracts Committee, the Board of Education, the town, about losing control of the plan design and management? 
<clears throat> there were two things that they did. First, the BOE negotiated into the contract a so-called cost cap. Specifically, if the cost to the town of being in the CPP's POS plan exceeds the cost that the town would occur based on its own claims experience with its own POS plan, the GOSA employees must, through payroll deductions, pay these excess costs out of their own pocket. This clause is specifically designed to align GOSA's interests with those of the BOE and the town in having a cost-effective health care plan. In this context, your Labor Contracts Committee urged the BOE and the town to keep careful track of the town's shadow plan, so to speak, not only to be able to trigger the cost cap, but also to serve as a statistical basis for any subsequent desire by the BOE or the town to leave the CPP as too expensive, even if the matter goes to arbitration. <clears throat> In addition, your Labor Contracts Committee urged the BOE and the town to keep on file various model calculations of how the cost caps should be calculated. These model calculations were generated during the course of the negotiations, and to our mind, these are important in case there are any disputes in the future on how the cost cap operates. To our mind, the importance of the cost cap is less about controlling the town's costs and more about ensuring that if the town wants out of the, CC, out of the CPP because of excessive costs, the union will want to get out as well because the union will's employees will be paying individually part of the excess costs through the cap mechanism. Thus, the cost cap will hopefully make it less likely that the union will want to arbitrate any future withdrawal of the town from the CPP. How did the BOE get GOSA to agree to the cost cap? This is part of the dynamics of labor negotiations. The town <clears throat> basically, uh, uh, or the BOE uh, basically was asked by uh, GOSA to agree to a further wage increase in order to get the union to agree to this particular cost cap, but the BOE resisted uh, granting such a further wage increase. But they did agree to make a one-time payment of slightly more than $100,000 into the 403B plan, annuity plan, which the town maintains for GOSA employees. A second mechanism <clears throat> which the BOE introduced to meet these concerns, the four concerns I mentioned above, was to place in the contract a so-called reopener clause, where the BOE and the town are allowed to demand renegotiation of the participation in the pool, state insurance pool, if the legislature changes the current law, such as to introduce political considerations into the operation of the CPP. Likewise, the reopener is triggered if there are any surprises in regard to the calculation of the Cadillac tax. And in fact, the final rules in regard to the Cadillac tax have not yet been issued by the Treasury Department. And surprises are possible since the federal government uh, and the current administration in Washington are rather desperate to receive the revenues from the Cadillac tax, estimated at between 90 to 100 billion dollars to help pay for the other costs of the Affordable Care Act. Although your Labor Contracts Committee thought the reopener clause was rather vaguely worded and had some undefined terms, the committee believed it was sufficient to at least force the issue of reopening negotiations. Nevertheless, the Labor Contracts Committee emphasized to both the Board of Education and the town that the committee was of the opinion that neither one of them should agree to any other collective bargaining agreement entering into the state insurance pool unless both the cost cap and the reopener negotiated with GOSA are also included in those collective bargaining agreements with any other union. After extensive discussion with Peter Shearer of the BOE negotiating team and Al Kava, the town's negotiator, as well as amongst ourselves, your labor contracts committee voted 3-1 to recommend approval of the GOSA contract by the RTM. <clears throat> it was the view of those voting to recommend approval that despite the concerns about GOSA entering into the CPP, the potential savings to the town, both in connection with this GOSA contract and possibly in connection with other unions over the next several years, were simply too large to ignore or overlook. overlook. The majority of the committee so voting to recommend approval based their decision in part 
on their assumption that over the next few years, the CPP will in fact be efficiently run and with little political influence, since the P CPP's administrators will want to endeavor to persuade as many municipalities as possible to join the CPP. The fact is, Greenwich is to a certain extent a pioneer in entering into uh, this uh, program with one of its the unions. Uh, as it is, the, t the BOE and the town must consider carefully how to respond to requests by other unions to join the CPP, and they must be vigilant in overseeing the operation and cost of the CP over the next years. That would entail the town and the BOE deciding whether the savings to the town outweigh the four concerns I mentioned above, and that is a decision that will need to be made in the near future. Keep in mind that if all unions representing employees of the BEO, BOE or all unions representing employees of the town enter into the CPP, the administrators of the CPP cannot cherry pick which unions they take up into the plan. Rather, they must accept all of the unions. Um, <clears throat> By the way, uh, well, let me, I'll skip that. Let me just mention that the one dissenting vote that we had was based on, I think, three concerns as they were mentioned in the meeting uh, by the dissenting vote. An unhappiness uh, over state labor, how state labor laws are stacked against town government in the course of negotiating such contracts. A general sense that possibly more concessions could have been gained from GOSA on various issues although we didn't discuss any specific proposals that the town might have made to get those concessions, uh, and a generalized sense that the cost of contract, despite the health care savings, uh, uh, were uh, too high. As noted, the committee voted 3-1 to recommend approval of this contract in light of the GWI being in conformity with the trends in the state and in light of the health care cost savings, coupled with what the LCC members currently believe are appropriate safeguards against plan abuse. Josh Brown with the Education Committee report. Mr. Moderator, fellow members and guests, the Education Committee met last Monday night in a joint session with Finance. Our vote on this item was 9-0-0. We covered much of what uh, the previous speaker uh, spoke to. Thank you. Michael Warner with the Finance Committee report. There'll be a 10-minute quiz on Mr. Ditchin's commentary following the meeting. Uh, the Finance Committee met jointly with um, the Education Committee and considered this item. There are, um, and following the joint meeting and discussion, we the Finance Committee had um, a wide-ranging discussion and let me just summarize a few points that might be of some importance in your decision. One is, one of the questions that came up is, how is it the state plan is so much less expensive than our plan? And um, how, it, how likely is it that that would stay that way, given that municipalities like Greenwich are going to go into this state plan? And the reason for the lower cost is because of lower experience. The cost of providing care outside of Fairfield County is much less, and the health experience of the individuals living outside of Fairfield County is much less than our experience. Particularly, I think, um, I heard it said that our firefighters and police and certain other categories have higher health uh, uh, costs than other, other parts. So. My point is, is that when, when we consider going, becoming part of the state plan, it's not a, um, it's not a highly transitory um, cost um, benefit to us. It's based on, on demographic kinds of issues that are likely to stay in place for some time. Uh, with respect to the labor agreement in general, we divided it into two parts. First was, as you heard Mr. Detchen say, was the, um, was the cost of um, wages across the board increases and the like. And in, these are my comments, all, uh, uh, our committee voted 911 in favor of this contract, but let me make a few comments as to why. 
what we're voting on is a middle management group. These are people and occupations that don't necessarily uh, deal with students on the day-by-day -day basis. They deal with teachers and they set the tone of what a work culture is like and these are principals and assistant principals and they're important, uh, they're an important category in our school system. Also, they're a category that's probably paid at or near the going rate for the job. Many, some of them are paid in the third quartile, a bit above, and um, some could argue that middle management individuals who are harder to replace should be paid a bit above the going rate. Uh, so for that reason, um, it did not cause great consternation to the Finance Committee that uh, this 2.6% uh, across the board increase was in place. With respect to the benefit piece, uh, I've probably covered that. I would say there is some risk going forward that you should consider, and that is we have on this initial contract with GOSA a pretty good format for a plan that could make sense in the longer term. However, this assumes that the town is resolute in, in obtaining the same conditions in the future that we have with future groups that we have with this group. There's no guarantee of that. Um, precedent does matter when issues are arbitrated, and this is a, a, a precedent that we can live with. Uh, so for these reasons, uh, the Finance Committee voted 9-1-1. We had one person, uh, District 7, vote against because there, we, we discussed some general issues with becoming part of any state plan whatsoever for any reason. Uh, and uh, we had one member who was substituting and wasn't entirely familiar with it, so he abstained. Uh, so our vote was 9-1-1. Thank you very much. Thank you. Discussion on item three. Mr. Scherr, did you want to address the item? All right. Lucia Jansen, Chair of our Budget Overview Committee. Oh, you have a report, I, right? I do, but I'm also, I wanted to speak first as a Labor Contract Committee member. Well, Which we're taking report? committee reports now. Okay, so. then I'll take a committee, I'll do the committee report. All right, so good evening. I wanna begin by thanking the Board of Ed, the town, and the CEA union for their time and effort with the agreement. Given the impact this contract will have on the fiscal year 2016-17 budget, the BOC felt it was an imperative to take up this labor contract vote as it has done in the past with other labor contracts. Therefore, the view is not through the prism of the collective bargaining process, but through the budget. It has been said by the Board of Ed in fiscal year 15-16 that 91% of the school budget was locked up in contractual salary ob obligations with only 9% remaining for student program and services. This 9.5% increase in this $28 million contract does not reduce the rate of spending and continues to crowd out essential spending for children programs and services. This amount is considered a very large proportion of spending towards labor contracts as compared to other districts. Given what the members have read in news regarding school issues, such as the late school uh, start for busing, the school lunch fund shortfall, the achievement gap programs, the 9.5% increase over the last contract was deemed too high. Further, it was noted the lack of productivity per employee in that the employee count since 2013 has actually increased 1.8 people. It was noted that New York, with a property tax cap, is in its fifth year of holding operating spending increases to 2% or less, which includes high cost health care and pension costs. Top ranking Westchester school districts, such as Scarsdale, Byram Hills, Bronxville, Dobbs Ferry, are delivering year after year budgets at 2% or less. Much of that has been delivered through lower cost labor contracts. I give example, Scar Scarsdale and Dobbs Ferry have come in at zero and have flat stipends that are being given. 
The BOC formally invited the Board of Ed representative in town to attend our meeting. The Board of Ed representative declined and the town had no response. The majority of the BOC prefers to see a more balanced approach to these labor contracts. The vote was 182 against the GOSA contract. Thank you. All right, before we get into discussion on this, I do have the results of the vote on items one and two. Item one was the appointment of Stephen Fong as an alternate member of the Inland Wetlands and Water Courses One Word Agency. Those in favor, 135, opposed 26, abstaining four. That item has carried. Item two is the appointment of uh, Peter Yeski to be a member of the Alarm Appeals Board. Those in favor, 162, opposed zero, abstaining two. That item has carried. Discussion on item three. Dr. Carlson, District 1. Mr. Moderator, members of the RTM and guests, over the past year, the price of gasoline, gold, silver, copper, and other commodities have fallen. This is a deflationary trend. I maintain we're right now in a somewhat deflationary, lightly deflationary, albeit, economy. A most disturbing thing came from Goldman Sachs about three weeks ago. Goldman Sachs uh, said that we were in the third wave, I quote, third wave of an economic phenomenon that began in 2008 with a stock market crash and a recession in the United States. The second wave was it passed to foreign countries. And the third wave is what we are in now, which I take as a deflationary phenomenon. I think it unwise to, uh, to reward some of your best paid employees with more money. I would ask you just to think, what kind of money can you get for your own money in a bank? What kind of interest? What kind of, especially if you are an older person? If people cannot make more money, should there be higher taxes? Should you reward your best paid uh, public employees with more money? I say no. I say that under these economic circumstances, these employees shouldn't have any increase at all. The tricky thing that we were going to face about this deflationary phenomenon is how long is it going to last? I thought uh, in the summer it wouldn't be something like a 1 to 3 percent uh, uh, deflation. I'm feeling more like 2 to 4 percent. Will it be over in a year? Will it be over in six months? Will it be over in five years? Japan has had a deflationary phenomenon that's gone on uh, for much more than a decade. We're into something that is different. Most people of my generation uh, faced inflation, and we got used to inflation. It looks like that in the terms of the Elizabethan, uh, that the war circle has turned full, and that we've come back to something like the phenomenon uh, that uh, our parents faced uh, in the 30s and 40s. It is very tricky, and I think that it would be particularly unwise uh, to grant this. But, I mean, just look at a little bit of the phenomenon recently. Last month, the Greenwich Time reported that the economy of Fairfield County from 2013 to 2014 increased one quarter, the GDP increased one quarter of 1% it would seem that it might go down uh, uh, a quarter of a percent of, of, uh, from this year, from 2014, if you're going to work in decline. 
let us not forget what happened with uh, the Federal Reserve at the end of September. Most people thought uh, there was going to be a small increase uh, in the uh, rates. This did not happen because the Federal Reserve wanted more information. Quite obviously, they were afraid of a deflationary phenomenon, and they could not make their uh, uh, inflation targets. In this contract, locking up for three years, I think it is a bad idea to get into it at this point. So I suggest to you that you consider voting no for it. I will vote no. Further discussion on item three. John Dolan, District 7. I will be brief, um, and kudos to uh, Mr. Detchen for uh, covering almost every topic that was uh, possibly going to be discussed here. He, he killed my speech that I had in mind. Um, we would just like to get that information a lot sooner uh, going forward. There are two themes that I would raise for your uh, consideration in why to vote against the contract. The first, I was the person um, that voted no on finance related to concerns about uh, the state of Connecticut. My business, my participation in uh, observing the retirement board is focusing on how various states handle pension accounts. And you may have seen a recent Wall Street Journal article that ranks Connecticut third from the bottom of um, their ability to kind of uh, fund uh, pensions. And so we are now taking an action that is not only giving them money on this plan, but with the notion that if it's good enough for these employees, it will be good for uh, other uh, employees. And I think that that's a bad trend. Um, there's news articles about how the state is not quite uh, got their controls in terms of even their current health care plan that we are, we are buying into. Um, right now, the employees, I would have them consider they have, the ascent, in a sense, a AAA obligation from Greenwich, possibly quadruple A. Uh, if they go to the state of Connecticut, they're getting into a state that has problems. By contrast or by comparison, I would share that the state of Illinois is not even paying its lottery winners. So if you have money coming to you, you may have to stand in line. So that was thing one, just an aversion towards shifting power here toward Hartford. Thing two is, as was uh, appropriately touched on, the notion of the Cadillac tax. I know that it had been a debate among all people in both the private and public sector as to who's going to take the share of paying for the Cadillac tax. Is it the employee or the employer? This contract seems to kind of uh, make that topic moot in that there's no mention of it uh, negotiated here. I don't think the state is going to pay our share of the Cadillac tax. I don't think the employees are going to be willing to contribute their share of the Cadillac tax. And so I think in going down this path, we've forfeited a potential negotiating point that either could have that tax shared in the future or, as Mr. Detchen uh, correctly pointed out, could be used to drive employee uh, cost saving toward DC plans, where we want to go in retirement and where we should be going in health care. And this contract and this move to the state plan undermines those efforts, so I'd encourage you to vote no on the contract. Hold your applause. Lucia Jansen, District 7. Good evening. Now I am speaking as a Labor Contract Committee member. As the LCC chair relayed, I did not vote in favor of the contract. Many of the reasons I have, you have heard earlier here, but most importantly, Greenwich will be the first town in Fairfield County in DRGA or DRGB, our districts that we compare ourselves to, to adopt the new Hartford-based health insurance plan. We are, in essence, establishing the two 2015-16 pattern for the new season that others will follow. So even though we hear that GWI wage settlements were on average 2.66% higher and so on, they were all based on settlements from the previous year in 2014-15. We were told at the LCC meeting that the entire Hartford delegation, Scott France, Fred Camillo, Livy Florin and Mike Pacino supported the 2015 Connecticut state law that created the Hartford-based health plan. Through my own research, I was surprised to learn that in fact it was just the opposite. There was unanimous opposition to the new labor union-sponsored law. 
that created the Connecticut Partnership Plan 2.0. Finally, I've spoken directly to two high-performing DRGA school districts, the town of Ridgefield and the town of Weston. Both thoroughly analyzed the state plan and have chosen not to enroll. A lot of concern over the lack of local control once the con first term contract expires. Also related was the lack of precedence established in arbitration. And finally, general distrust with Hartford given direct experience with the teacher's retirement system and mentioned a recent audit in 2014 when auditors found, quote unquote, the lack of internal controls and accounting procedures as shocking. Some say that even though they disagree with losing local control with a new Hartford plan, given the lower cost of health premium, is one way for Greenwich to get its due from all the taxes we pay to Hartford. I do not share this view, since these highly subsidized Hartford labor contracts crowd out essential state and local services, and then painful, painful cuts need to be made, even in Greenwich, as we have seen with our local hospital and nursing home. I would like to close by recommending that in the future, the LCC is given facts, research, and explanatory comments prior to the night of the final LCC meeting vote in order for the committee to have sufficient time to thoughtfully review and study the information given. In closing, I hope you join me in either voting against this contract or abstaining on the contract, given the ambiguity of information. Thank you. Further discussion on item three? Garrett Argento, District 7. Moderator, <coughs> fellow, <coughs> fellow members of the uh, RTM, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> My name is Garrett Argento and I serve as a delegate on the Town Services Committee. The proposed contract was not brought before that committee. <coughs> the overall increase in the proposed contract is 9.5%. In my opinion, this is excessive for four reasons. First, we do not need to pay our school administrators more because of inflation. Inflation is flat. In 2016, next year, Social Security payments will be flat. This will be the third time in five years that people receive no increase in their Social Security payments. <clears throat> the salary component of this contract is 2.6% increase. That is over three times the rate of inflation. Second, <clears throat> we do not need to pay our administrators more because of productivity increases. Neither the union nor the town has argued that productivity has increased. In fact, the number of administrators has increased, where the student population has remained flat. Economists tell us <clears throat> that if the number of employees needed to do the work decreases, that indicates an increase in productivity. If the number of employees, <clears throat> excuse me, if the number of employees increases and the work requirement stays the same, that indicates a decline in productivity. Are we increasing compensation in return for getting a decline in productivity? Third, we do not need <clears throat> to increase pay at over three times the rate of inflation to support the recruitment and retention of our administrators because their turnover is very low. And fourth, our administrators are already well paid. For comparison, consider the salaries at the U.S. Department of Education. This is an administrative cabinet level department where 4,400 employees are hired for a full work year to administer a budget of $68 billion. The U.S. Under Secretary of Education, number two in the department, makes $183,300. The department's chief financial officer makes $158,700. And the chief information officer makes 189, sorry, 148,700. 
In Greenwich, in year one of the proposed contract, a headmaster will make $189,012, which is more than the Undersecretary of Education makes. A Greenwich program coordinator will make $154,800, and a program administrator will make $144,020. Along with their generous compensation, our administrators get rock-solid job security, something the private sector taxpayers in Greenwich do not get. I recommend that you vote no, or at least abstain, on this contract to show our labor contract negotiators and our political leaders that it is time for a new labor policy. We need to be fair to the unions, but we also need to be fair to the taxpayers whom we represent. This contract, as well as other contracts negotiated by our leaders, is, in my opinion, not fair to the taxpayers. Thank you. Margaret Freiburg, District 7. Our uh, Labor Contracts Committee Chairman said that if we go into this state health plan, we will be pioneers. And pioneers is one way to look at it. Uh, another way to look at it would be that we would be guinea pigs. And it has often been said that fools rush in where angels fear to tread. Um, if Others rush into this plan, other municipalities, and have a glowing experience in it, we could presumably join the plan later. But given what we all know about programs in Hartford and our, uh, why we all cherif cherish home rule as much as we did, I question whether now is an appropriate time to jump into this pond, especially given the questions over whether we could get out of it again, ever. Um, in addition, I am uh, reminded tonight of the controversy over the uh, proposal to ma make the start time at the schools later than it is. And particularly at Greenwich High School, I believe it's very important. I had three kids who went through Greenwich High School, and one minute were all zombies because of having to be up at 6 o'clock. We are told in some quarters that the reason we should not put them on a humane schedule is that we can't afford it. Why should, the, why should we be spending more money on people who are already very well compensated to compensate them at higher rate of increase than the taxpayers are receiving and then not have enough money in the budget to relieve our students of their inhumane conditions? So I would recommend voting against or abstaining on this proposal. Further discussion on item three. Is it Mr. Oberwager? Excuse me. Mr. Oberwager? District five. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, fellow members of the RTM. I stand before you again as a parent of two Riverside School students, third, fourth and fifth graders. And I also a attend a lot of events at the school um, and I plan to attend a lot of events at Eastern Middle School next year. And I know that the people that we're talking about, the headmaster and assistant headmaster at Riverside School, uh, both Christopher Weiss and Marianne McCullough, two people that I spend a lot of time with and my children spend a lot of time with, are very dedicated to the schools and the, and the students, specifically on a day-in, day-out basis. And to stand up here and to speak on their behalf as to why this contract is a good decision to move forward with, um, I stand here because not only have we vetted this through the Board of Education, 
Some of the members are here. Not only have we gone through the, the proper course that we have, you know, the, the, uh, the BET to review this, but when we, we start reviewing contracts that have been made after the fact and start quoting uh, statistics on deflationary periods, we are losing the point, which is that these people are members of our community who need to be compensated for their work appropriately, and they need to be retained and also drawn into this community so that we all can continue to have the values of our homes increase rather than stay stagnant, and that we can all then sell our homes, God willing, at a higher price than we bought them because our school system is known as one of the top school systems in this state. What you think about Hartford is irrelevant. You live in the state of Connecticut. That's part of living in the state of Connecticut. Our capital is Hartford. You may not like it, but you've got to deal with it. So the reality is I think we're spending way too much time talking about way too many issues besides the, the real issue, which is that our administrators are the heart and soul of our school system. So please vote in favor of this. Thank you. Karen Fossiliotis, District 7, to be followed by David Detchen, District 10. I wasn't going to speak until this speaker spoke because I'm a, a little upset with the tone um, and the insinuation that All right, this let, body... Let's make it clear that everyone is entitled uh, I understand to speak that. their mind. No, I'm, I'm saying on both sides. I don't know why we're so upset about hearing opposing views. No, this I, is how the system works. Majority it, will rule. And let's hear all sides the, of the issues. The, no, I'm, the, not, I'm not being critical of you. I'm saying we don't need to get into that discussion that you're about to bring up. Everyone is no. free to express their point of view. Now okay. you have the floor to do that. I, I am expressing my view. The purpose of the RTM is to review this contract. Um, the BOE uh, aside and all the other um, agencies and, and commissions and whoever else has reviewed this contract, the RTM has the responsibility to review this contract and to offer their opinions and, and the committees that have spoken um, have spoken on this issue. And all I am saying is that I would respectfully ask that this body uh, weigh the, the pros and the cons that have been, uh, been uh, presented tonight and uh, come to a decision based on the arguments that have been made and that have been presented to you. Um, and I would urge you to vote this contract down. David Detchen, District 10. Well, let's, we'll, I'll call upon you after Mr. Detchen speaks. Uh, okay, I'm now speaking as a member of the RTM, not as a chairman of uh, the Labor Contracts Committee. Um, let me make about four observations here very quickly. First of all, uh, I would suggest that it's not really possible for us to compare um, labor negotiation results in New York with labor negotiation results in Connecticut because obviously the legislative atmosphere or s situation in New York is entirely different. The real, cap the real property tax tap completely changes the tone and the orientation of, of the labor contract negotiations in New York, and we don't have that kind of a, a situation here. Uh, second, I'll, I'll make the same observation that I have made a number of times from this podium, and that is that it's my belief, um, not as a member of the Labor Contracts Committee, but just as a member of the RTM, that it is exceedingly difficult to achieve budget cost reductions through labor contract negotiations. The dynamics are completely uh, inappropriate for that. The state law completely ad agitates against that. And that really the way to achieve significant reductions in budget costs is through the budgetary process and a careful thought, carefully thought out plan on how to reduce budgetary costs. For example, I spoke earlier about savings 
in health care. But those savings that I spoke about in quotes are not reductions in budgetary costs. They're reductions in the anticipated increases in budgetary costs that we should expect over the next several years. Real reductions in budgetary costs are very difficult to achieve through labor negotiations. As far as our wanting, not wanting to pay uh, any employee, whether it's GOSA union members or anyone else, anything more than the rate of inflation, we have to keep in mind the way the state arbitration law is set up. Take, for example, these GOSA administrators. We could go into arbitration and we could say, we don't want to pay any more than a half percent because we think that's maybe what the inflation rate is. If, in fact, as we have now, the average increase in other towns has been 2.6 percent, GOSA can then go in and say, we'd like for it to be 2.8 percent. The arbitrators don't get to average the two demands. They have to pick one or the other. So if we go in and suggest a half a percent, and GOSA suggests 2.8 percent, the odds are good that we're going to end up paying the 2.8 percent because that's what the arbitrators are likely to conclude. It's closer to the average. This is reality. As much as we would like to reduce that GWI down to a half percent, it ain't going to happen under the current arbitration uh, situation that we have. And that's why I say it's difficult to achieve significant budgetary cost reductions through labor negotiations. Finally, uh, Ms. Freiberg is absolutely right, and as I said, we're pioneers. I'm quite willing to use the word guinea pig, you know, uh, we're, we're out there first. But frankly, your labor contracts committee, and I in my own personal opinion, am fully aware that the Board of Education negotiating team went into these negotiations fully cognizant of those four concerns that I laid out. Indeed, those were concerns that we discussed with the head of the negotiating team in the course of our deliberations. And the BOE negotiating team endeavored to address those issues by the cost cap and the reopener. I think the issue for us tonight is to decide whether the cost savings are so significant, <clears throat> including those that might be achieved by other unions going into this, that our rather vague, generalized fears of what might go on in Hartford are adequately met by the two clauses that have been added to the contract. My personal view is that there's sufficient protection there <clears throat> and that the cost savings are significant enough that we should go ahead, and I'll vote that way. But frankly, it's up to all of you to decide whether you agree with me or don't. Wilma Nasinovich, District 2. Uh, this is actually the answer to part of my question. My, uh, my question was, can you explain the process? Yeah, why don't you come forward so all can hear? Wilma Nasinovich, District 2. My question was, uh, what is the process if we uh, turn down this contract? What then happens? All right, Mr. McLaughlin will answer that question for us. Assistant Town Attorney, Jean McLaughlin. Mr. Moderator, members of the Representative Town Meeting, uh, the question that's been asked is the process if the uh, contract is, is rejected by the RTM. Correct. All right. Um, in these uh, matters, the town uh, retains uh, specialized counsel, uh, labor counsel to assist the Board of Education, uh, and sometimes the labor contracts uh, coordinator, uh, officer. And uh, they've issued an opinion on, uh, on this about what the process is that's based on their summary and review of the general statutes. Um, if the 
contract is rejected by the RTM, then it uh, goes to arbitration. Um, the arbitration uh, process starts within five days of the rejection uh, of the contract by the RTM. The statute reads that the parties can uh, mediate. However, that uh, mediation is restricted uh, until the start of the arbitration hearings. Um, <clears throat> so both sides would pick an arbitrator within five days. Uh, they usually there's three arbitrators. Uh, one is a neutral that's uh, picked by the uh, Commissioner of Education or whatever the process they have to pick the neutral. Uh, once the arbitration uh, hearing convenes, the uh, hearings must conclude within uh, 25 days, and then the arbitration panel has 20 days to issue its award. Um, this actually goes through a process of actually we're trying to determine what the issues are because the parties had reached an agreement, so some uh, determination has to be made of what the what is agreed upon, what is the final last and best offer on both sides, uh, from which the arbitrators will pick one or the other. If the um, if the arbitration uh, is then filed again uh, with the town clerk, it would go before the representative town meeting. At that time. Uh, it would have to be rejected by um, it would have to be rejected by two thirds of those present at the representative town meeting. Uh, if uh, and then it would go back to arbitration, and uh, <clears throat> at that point uh, it would be another arbitration. At which point the uh, which would follow another similar time frame. Again, it would go to the last final last and best offer on items that had not been agreed upon, and then eventually you get before uh, a, the superior court uh, in terms of either one party or the other appealing the decision. I believe if, uh, if, if the RTM were to reject an arbitration award, the town would then pay all costs thereafter, is that correct? That is correct. Thank you. Yes, uh, who has their hand up? Mr. Datchin. Mr. Detchen, point of information. Yes. Is it not the case that if this uh, party rejects that, that neither party can put any issue on the table for, uh, for our trainer, including issues that may not necessarily have been negotiated? All right. The question is, what would the scope of the arbitration be if the RTM were to reject this agreement tonight? Could it include issues that were not negotiated? Um, in the agreement that's before us. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is not particularly my field. However, I have re reviewed the opinion of Shipman and Goodwin on this. Uh, they point out, that the attorneys who are specialists in this area, that the, uh, the procedure before, uh, when you have the Board of Education involved, is that unlike uh, MIRA, which is the Municipal Employees Relation Act, uh, which limits the issues to what had actually been on the table, uh, the opinions of our special counsel indicate that uh, other issues concerning what's defined by statute as being negotiable uh, can be put on the table. That's my reading of their opinion. Thank you. All right, Michael Watzik, District 11. Yes, Mr. Von Kaiserling. Mr. Von Kaisling, are you moving uh, to limit debate? I would uh, like to limit debate to one more person for three minutes. <laughs> All right. It has been moved and seconded to limit debate on item three to Mr. Wutzik for three minutes. Um, the motion to limit debate is not itself debatable, and it requires a two-thirds majority to pass. I will call for a voice vote. All those in favor of cutting off debate on this after Mr. Wutzik speaks for a maximum of three minutes, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? No. The motion is carried. Mr. Wutzik. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and ladies and gentlemen of the RTM. 
I'm a uh, member of the Labor Contracts Committee, and I was one of the three yes votes in favor of this contract. Uh, for those of you who are thinking about voting no on this contract tonight, I ask you to consider what you want to happen and what you think will happen if you vote no. If you want a lower GWI than 2.6% that's embedded in this contract, well, in arbitration, that's not likely to happen. As David Detchen explained, um, given that 2.6% is very close to the average increase negotiated by other municipalities, uh, the BOE negotiators are going to have to put something very close to that on the table. Otherwise, the arbitrator is likely to pick a uh, GOSA counter that is probably a little bit higher than 2.6. So I don't think as a practical matter it's likely that we're going to achieve something materially lower than 2.6 percent, however much we all want that to happen. It's just not likely. If you don't like the idea of going into the state pool for health care, well, okay, what do you think will happen if we vote no? And what are you going to want the Board of Ed to do in arbitration? You're going to want them to say, okay, we don't want to go into the pool? Okay, well, then we have just conceded higher costs. We've, we've said, okay, we actually would rather have higher costs than take the savings that are actually on the table. I mean, the fact that this contract, uh, that the, the state pool entry is proposed by the union doesn't mean it's a bad idea. It actually is one of those classic win-win situations. The town's going to save money. The employees are going to be happy. Why don't we see that as a win-win? So if we go to arbitration and our stance is we don't want uh, to go into the state pool, and the union does want us to go into the state pool, well, if the arbitrator gives it to GOSA, that's what we've got now. And if we win and we don't go into the state pool, we have higher costs. I mean, I, we're always complaining about how um, Greenwich is disadvantaged by things that are happening statewide. This is one of those unusual situations where we're actually going to benefit because we're going into uh, a state plan that has lower costs because the average costs of health care and, and the average utilization throughout the state is lower than in Fairfield seconds. County. So we're actually benefiting in this case from going in with the rest of the state. We're usually not in that kind of a position. So as you consider your vote, I just ask you to think about what it is you want to happen and what do you think will happen if you reject the contract and I would argue that it's very unlikely that we would improve upon the situation if we end up in arbitration. Thank you. All right. Will the district chairs please mark your voting cards, item number three, and proceed to pull your delegation. Now, Mr. McLaughlin, in order to approve this, we require a simple majority. And in absence of a simple majority, this would be considered to be rejected. All right. So if you are in favor of this contract, you vote yes. If you are opposed, you vote no. Since that is the last item to come before us, we will await the resolution and tally of this vote before proceeding to adjourn. Once again, I would like to remind our members uh, to put December 14 on your calendar. Please make sure you make that meeting so that you can experience the new auditorium at Greenwich High School. And another reminder to the parade on November 11th, that's a Wednesday, down Greenwich Avenue. I can tell you it was a, uh, a memorable affair um, in the past. And if you can make it, that would be wonderful.
Yes, and please don't forget to put your uh, candidate registration that's completed first and last page in the box at the front of the hall. All right, we have the result of the vote on item three. This is the GOSA contract. Those in favor, 112. Opposed, 34. Abstaining, 16. That item has carried. Mr. Von Keiseling, Chair of District 8, uh, the town clerk would like to see you, please. There being no further business to come before the meeting, and absent objection, this meeting stands adjourned upon unanimous consent. Thank you all for coming. Have a safe trip home.